country's attention was turned in recent days to the occupation out west in Oregon of a national wildlife facility. Here to talk about that event in a broader context now is David Nywert. David is an investigative journalist and author based in Seattle. His most recent book is Of Orcas and Men, What Killer Whales Can Teach Us. He's a contributing writer to the Southern Poverty Law Center. He has been on the program before, and we're delighted to have him back. David, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, RJ. Hey, listen, I wanted to, obviously, you're the guy I thought about. You You study the right. You know the. You know this world. And in recent days, you've had uh, a couple pieces published, one in the Washington Post, uh, about uh, about what's and one at the Southern Poverty Law Center about this occupation uh, that's going on now in Oregon and uh, the uh, Clive and Bundy sons are involved. So uh, let's start with this. Um, what, if any, is a cause and effect relationship between uh, the the incident at Clive and Bundy's ranch in Nevada and this incident this week uh, in Oregon. Well, there's a sort of direct causal relationships, primarily because, you know, the sons of Clive and Bundy are the people who are doing the same act uh, up in up in Oregon. And um, they're basically pushing the same sort of um, seditious uh, interpretation of of the Constitution, where you know they b- believe that the government's illegitimate, and uh, they, they want to, much as they did in Nevada, uh, they're trying to force the federal government into a position of uh, giving away uh, public lands, and um, you know th- this is uh, they're products of the Patriot movement, they're products of this. Um, extremist belief system that argues that the federal government is not a legitimate entity and that they don't have any business uh, holding all these uh, public properties. Uh, And, you know, basically it's a system that, or it's a sort of culture, a political culture that produces eventually a number of violent and extremist acts. And so, um, but more to the point is the fact that when back when in April of 2014, when there was that standoff at the Bundy Ranch, and weapons were drawn, and there were federal agents out there who were having guns pointed at them, and the stuff was videotaped and it was photographed, and we, you know, they know who was pointing guns at, at people. And yet there were, and let's be clear, that's a federal offense. It's a felony uh, to point a gun at a federal law enforcement officer. So there are a bunch of people out there breaking the law who should have eventually had to face the the long arm of the law uh, for their actions out there, and who never did, including Clive and Bundy and his clan, uh, who engaged in all kinds of acts of you know, violent resistance out there, uh, including brandishing weapons and that sort of thing. So you're saying you get to break the law with impunity on camera and are punished for it, then it's no surprise when some of the same cast of characters figures they can go break the law again. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, and And that's... uh, and that has that's what has happened here. Um, I noticed that uh, one of the people who was standing behind uh, Ammon Bundy the other day at his press conference was a good character who we know from the Northwest uh, named uh, uh, Eric E.J. Parker. Parker is somewhat notorious for. He's the fellow you saw in those photographs uh, lying down on the freeway and aiming his sniper rifle between concrete abutments out there on the freeway at the Bundy Ranch. Um, And he was right there standing behind Ammon Bundy (laughs) the other day at a press conference. So, um, you know, they clearly haven't changed tactics at all. And, you know, they've been been, been 
it's, fortunately, they haven't actually brandished any weapons yet, uh, as far as we know. But although they did evict the employees from the uh, the wildlife refuge center. Um, did and, they do that uh, at gunpoint, or did they just tell them get out? They just told them to get out. But, you know, when you got a bunch of guys with AR-15s over your shoulders, you don't need to have them point them at anybody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know what exactly happened. what you're saying. We're talking with writer David and I were about the occupation in uh, in Oregon. Now, uh, one, but just in terms of understanding the philosophy of these guys, I know this is a stupid question. I've asked you before. We, we talked back in April 2014. I probably asked you then, but I, I, I'm still scratching my head over it. How can you call yourself a patriot and then point a gun at the representative of the country you supposedly love so much? How can you call yourself a constitutionalist when the Constitution has rules for how you adjudicate disputes and you're challenging those rules and the judges adjudicate them at some point how are you not i mean i'm not big on name calling well, and strategy well, yeah how are you I mean, it's important to understand that that these guys live in an alternative universe where our rules don't apply and only their rules do so in their universe um you know i mean yeah i mean <laughs> look at the oath that they these oath keepers are supposedly uh, keeping up the you know the oath keepers or the patriot militia group that we see out at a lot of these events and who were played a big role at the Bundy Ranch and um and they've actually disavowed these people in Oregon uh yet you know they're very much part of the same sort of patriot militia scene and those guys are very selective about which part of the oath that they say they're going to uh, follow because there's a line in there uh, in the oath that military officers have to take that one, of, which is one of the oaths that they say that they're keeping. It talks about that says directly, uh, "I will obey the orders of the president." You know, <laughs> and it, in their alternative universe, this president is a, is not a legitimate president because uh, you know the birther controversy, or uh, he's secretly a Muslim, or whatever. Um, you know, they they have a whole litany of excuses for why uh, things are, you know, wh wh why they can do these sort of hypocritical things. And, um, yeah, so calling themselves patriots, yeah, no, that's, and that's been part of the deal ever since the 1990s, which is when I started writing about the patriot movement, you know, when they were organizing militias out here in the Northwest and elsewhere in the country. And, um you know, they've been around a long time, and people thought that they went away, but they didn't. They just kind of lurked under the surface for most of the Bush years and then sprang back to life as soon as Obama was elected president. And we've had this so huge that's upswing. E that's an in, easy in one to figure, groups. David and I. We're, it, it, it's easy to figure that, well, they, they come back and they get they get sparked because there's a president uh, whose legitimacy they can they can feel comfortable questioning because he doesn't look like them and and mm -hmm. and he doesn't even pretend to share their philosophies uh but uh and by the way I do have to say I look at these guys and my first thought is a constitutional scholar but uh, having said that now we're seeing something odd you know when you and I last talked I think it was during the Clive and Bundy occupation mm -hmm. and and um, they were getting this love and support from Sean Hannity and <laughs> and the Fox News crowd and some yep. Republican elected officials. This time around, there's a split. There's a split on the right. They're not mm -hmm. getting that kind of love. And uh, they're also, as you mentioned, even some of the other militia groups aren't supporting them. What's that all about? Well, a lot of it has to do with the... the the fact that that Bundy and his faction are really always were kind of a splinter group, and it was something of a miracle that um, they came together long enough as, as long as they did, uh, long enough to have that actual armed standoff about a week and a half into the, um, the into the you know sort of confrontation that had that they had brewed up on right wing media. And um, it was sort of, you know, I mean, it's part of sort of right-wing mythology now that uh, the Bundy Ranch standoff was this great moment for a victory for their cause and so on and so forth. 
but the reality is um, it was also very brief <laughs> uh, coming together because these groups are normally so contentious and so um, ego-driven and so driven by this sort of puritanical approach to their ideologies that, you know, it's very rare for them to ever co cohesively stick together for very long at all. And indeed, you know, at the Bundy Ranch, you know, within two weeks, they were all at each other's throats and and uh, getting all paranoid about supposed drone attacks on the camp and and uh, eventually wound up pointing guns at each other and making death threats. And the whole thing was split apart in, in quite a, uh, a bit of rancor and bile, but that's all gotten forgotten. <laughs> and... Uh, oh. And so realistically, that's what sort of the cloud that these guys were going up there and, and trying to do their organizer standoff under. It was had already been kind of a splintered movement anyway. And um, when Ammon Bundy just decided to do this after talking with God, apparently, at least according to his video, uh, and people like Stuart Rhodes from the Oath Keepers and guys from the 3% militia that were over there who were actually helping to uh, do the protest that Saturday um, were all not included on in Bundy's plan, and he just kind of went off and did this on his own with the help of this, you know, sort of small cluster of militiamen, some of whom are, were involved with the Bundy camp back in 2014. So... Um, well, you know, that's look, what we're seeing now. So so what do you think the authorities should do? Uh, the, uh, there are those who say they should go in and um, and uh, just whatever, do whatever they have to do, smoke them out or tear gas or whatever. There are those who say, well, no, the, we don't need a replay of Waco. Or where do you stand on that? How do you think the authorities should... Well, I think all of these people could be arrested for criminal trespass at this point. So um, really, I think, uh, you know, I, I've seen how they handle uh, this sort of thing. Yeah, I'm totally against uh, anything like Waco or, you know, I mean, people who uh, think that, <laughs> that argue, well, it should be uh, like at Ferguson, you know, I mean, comparing it to how they would treat black people. Um, I, I argue that that's asking the wrong question because uh, we don't want that stuff, you know. I mean, and we saw that in the 90s with Ruby Ridge and Waco that this heavy-handed government, uh, uh, federal law enforcement response uh, with SWAT teams and guns a-blazing uh, is just disastrous. And it's just a, it, it should never happen. And But we also saw in the 1990s, at least one, uh, clearly the federal authorities back then actually learned their lesson because by 1996, when they had the uh, standoff with the, the Montana Freeman out there in Jordan, Montana, they did it right. They simply waited the guys out. They surrounded them with, um, with you know, federal uh, law enforcement agents Um they didn't allow anybody in or out, and, and they waited until the guys were willing to come out on their own. Um, the Freeman, as it happened, had a, like a, a compound out there where you know they were able to survive for quite a while. So they were out there for 81 days. Uh, these guys are begging for snacks now, so I, think, <laughs> I don't think they will last very long if you cut their power and surround them. And I would say once they start coming out, I mean, supposedly they're, they're – free to move now and go down to the grocery store and do whatever, um, I would say arrest them when they start coming out. I mean, they've got grounds to arrest them now. So um, I don't think they need to have a heavy-handed SWAT team type response, but um, I think they, they can certainly uh, surround the place and start arresting people as they come and go. And, but it uh, doesn't look like they're doing, they're going to do that, does it? No, it doesn't look like it so far. Um, and I think it's a mistake. You know, um, it's it's not you're not creating martyrs that way. You're just um, enforcing the law and standing up for the rule of law. And, and we've seen the, the consequences directly in this case of not standing up and making the arrests and, and going for the convictions that you should be going for uh, and, and letting these guys get away with this stuff because 
um, of whatever calculations these guys are making. Because right, and the pattern appears to be if you don't enforce the law with these guys, they're just going to do it again and again. That's um, right. And unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But David and I, were, you're, you're an expert in this stuff. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the program and filling us in. My pleasure, RJ, as always.